Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to the Liberty Report. With us today is Daniel McAdams, this is our co-host. Daniel, good to see you today. Another Monday, Dr. Paul. How are you? I'm doing fine, thank you. Oh, good, good, good. And uh, I'm going to have to mow my lawn pretty soon. Yeah. <laughs> the drought is over. I hope. <laughs> Who knows? Hope. Yeah. But we can always call somebody in Washington and say, send us a little more water. Yeah, please. <laughs> so... August fifteenth today, by the way. Yes, you know, it's a special um, day. That day is. I, I wouldn't know, use that term about living in, you know. <laughs> uh, but it was a special day for me. But it's not a special day for very many people. But more people now than maybe five years ago, because uh, when it happened, I had anticipated it happening soon. And yeah, we're thinking back to 1971 because yeah. we were having uh, inflation back there and a bad economy and and we had outprinted our dollar and uh, we had already taken the gold uh, alternative away from American citizens. So you couldn't really uh, decide the real value of the dollar because the, you, you couldn't buy and sell gold in the market. Uh, Roosevelt did that way back in 34. <clears throat> but uh, all of a sudden, uh, the anticipation was because De, De, De Gaulle and a, free, a few French uh, economists said, hey, they're ripping us off. They're just printing money. And, <laughs> and, and they claim it's worth $35 an ounce. <laughs> well, they called the bluff and they started turning in dollars. And that was his story. That was the announcement, really, uh, that we were bankrupt. Not that uh, everything would crash and burn and be over with, but we were bankrupt in that. That dollar, it would be definitely unsound and big things would happen <clears throat> immediately and afterwards and they continue to happen. It was a big event. And of course, uh, it ushered in the, a decade of uh, very, very bad economy and gold uh, going from 35 to $800. That's, yeah, a, big, that's, that's a, a big jump. <laughs> if we did that much ratio today, it'd be in many, many thousand. <laughs> but it also, uh, unleash the ability of our government as long as we could maintain the deception that we were powerful enough militarily and economically that we could get away with just printing money be the counterfeiter and in many ways we have gotten away with a lot but I think our current crisis is a reflection of not getting away with it so easily and they're not going to get away with it much more. So it, it's a big day, August 15th. That was a big day in monetary history. It was a big day for Nixon. It, uh, it, that was still when they weren't uh, quite talking about getting rid of him. But uh, he, he, uh, he issued the wage and price controls, the confiscation of gold, uh, no uh, uh, buying of gold by foreigners. And it upset the apple cart is still there, and yeah. I think all that activity is going to get much worse. Well, it's also another anniversary. We celebrated the 50th anniversary of Nixon closing the gold window last August the 15th with an event appropriately at a brewery. <laughs> and I know you weren't too happy about being in a brewery on Sunday, and I'll, I'll take that point. But let's just review, uh, refresh ourselves on what happened. It was such a fun event. Here's you and Jim, the great Jim Grant, just before the event. Um, and let's do the next one. A little slideshow here. Here I am introducing. It was packed. The brewery is packed. We had a special room there. Do the last one, just a quickie. And here's Dr. Paul giving his talk. That was a lot of fun. We should, maybe I can talk you into doing it and get again. Maybe some of our audience know a great brewery by them with a private room that we can have a little event there. The you know what my rule is, sometimes you want to be sad and sometimes you don't want to be too excitable. But I think it, if you don't, <laughs> uh, there's something wrong with a person because nobody knows what the future will bring. So you might as well enjoy the present. And it's difficult at times for all of us. But still, at our conventions and our meetings and conferences, uh, I think generally there's like-minded people there that like to talk about it's esoteric things like August 15th. Yeah, yeah. August 15th, who cares about that? Well, the reason why it sticks with me is that was that period of time that I decided probably subconsciously more than anything, that, you know, I need to speak out yeah. on the issue of money. <laughs> and, uh, so, so 
and it's still there. I still need to talk about it, but what I can't talk about the dollar because the dollar's gone. There's no <laughs> definition to it. <laughs> yeah. but, but anyway, I want to talk a little bit today about uh, you know the nonsense going on with uh, genderism yeah. and uh, changing sexes, and, and it's uh, it's not just in the United States. It's a worldwide phenomenon. This whole thing is revolutionary stuff. Zero Hedge carried an article that caught my attention. It says, in Spain, 16-year-olds will soon be able to change their gender without their parents' consent. So there's a couple issues there. Is it a good idea for a young kid, uh, and some of them are not even 10 years old, yeah. that they have professionals brainwashing them why they have to have all this surgery, and now... Uh, it's without the parents, but it's already that way now because, uh, you know, I, I, I got annoyed way back when uh, they, they started asking, uh, uh, they wouldn't ask parents about uh, kids getting abortions. And, and that, that was uh, controversial, but a, about a big issue. Yeah. And, and now, uh, you know, but when I started in medicine back in the 60s, the rules were still, you don't mess with kids. The kids uh, have protectors, the, and the people who speak for them, whenever available, and most of the time they are, are the parents. So you you didn't if a if a kid came in probably under 16 or that close. As a matter of fact, even at 16, you usually you know if you didn't have the parents right there and you needed to stop some bleeding and so up somebody, you would get them on the phone. I mean, the hospitals were meticulous and all of us, you know, thought about it, but they don't even think about it now. They think about how to get around it. Don't, don't let the parents get involved in this. They'll just, you know, they'll just annoy us. Yeah. What, what do they know? Do they, do they think they have control and own their children? Well, they're supposed to have the responsibility of their children. So this, this to me is bad. It's another step. We've already taken many steps in this direction of, uh, you know, abuse to children in this sense. But I think this type of stuff will continue to spread and be worldwide. I guess Soros had a lot of money. He probably <laughs> influenced, you know, the judicial system all around the world. But uh, this is not a good sign uh, for us as a society. Yeah, let's put up that, that next clip just if our audience wants to look back at this story. It's a reprint from a, a, from a publication called Remix, but we saw it on Zero Hedge. In Spain, 16-year-olds will soon be able to change their gender without their parents' consent. Uh, and it's very interesting, Dr. Paul, for a number of reasons. First of all, it's the alignment of political forces because many on the left are very upset with this new trans law in Spain. Um, and as the article points out, Carmen Calvo, uh, w she is a radical left feminist, but she's against this because they also view this trans movement as a war on women because you, know, you can't be, you can't you define women. Men are competing as women in sports and destroying uh, uh, female sports. So it's interesting. So this passed uh, in, in their uh, parliament in June, and it's now, I guess, about to take effect. Um, but as you say, it undermines, of course, parental consent uh, for 16-year-olds and over. Of course, in the U.S., you can't even go drink a beer if you're 16, but you can do God knows what, changing all sorts of things in your body. Uh, it's, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty terrible. It's pretty upsetting. But it reminds me of one thing, if, you know, for many years you've been talking about cultural Marxism. And I confess at first I, I wasn't sure where, what was happening with this, you know, what it meant. But I realized, you know, shortly afterward, after reading a lot of the things that you wrote, and I wrote a little bit about this as an update this weekend, but you nailed it because the whole purpose of this is to undermine the family. And I think that's what this does, undermine the, the structure, the hierarchy of a family as parents versus children. And so I don't even think it's about trans so much. I think that's just an excuse for a different... Is that conspiratorial? <laughs> yeah, that's a good one, though. <laughs> but, you know, you make the mention that even the left will start uh, saying they agree with it on something from their point of view. But, you know, I often wonder why it never comes up with conservatives and liberals uh, debating or giving speeches about abortion. Uh, so I wonder how the left, I've, I've never heard anybody ask, you know, a far leftist who think that, you know, abortion is, uh, you know, a sacred right and that sort of thing. And ask them, well, uh, would you have a hesitation about people who decide that uh, they will do a sex check on the fetus? Oh, yeah. Maybe. 
and they decide that society has too many women mm. and they, you can get permission and paid to abort the female and not them you don't hear them yeah. them talking about that you know that was uh, uh, my i thought my question was pretty good when i was on the view when i said what, i described what a what a baby looks like yeah. at nine months yeah and their only answer to my scenario there was that's not what we're talking about yeah. and I, that's probably what they'd have to resort to oh that's not what we're talking about yeah, yeah but that's you, if if you want uh, if you want it that that's exactly what will happen but the big thing is is the responsibility i mean it's uh you know uh, wh whether it's check sex changes or doing abortions or getting a laceration so so yeah. that it defies what you just made the point of it uh, it defies the principle of parental responsibility to children matter of fact uh, that's why doris gordon an avowed atheist libertarian um, became right to life because she said that uh, uh, that the responsibility she believed in parental responsibility yeah. as a libertarian, huh. which would be be one way of handling a lot of problems. But uh, that that not too many people use that uh, as an argument. Uh, but uh, I, I think it's sort of this this stuff is really sad, and uh, you, you know uh, it's. It is. You you make that point. It's just that it's just that it is. It's very destructive. Yeah. And then because of we live in a society now where we have uh, a lot of uh, unmarried women and girls have been pregnant. We have people uh, who uh, who are pregnant. Then there's a divorce in the middle, and mm. who's uh, who has the control? It gets, it gets very very complicated. And sometimes, like I think now, the child is being lost. But uh, you know, there, there, you know, for, for me, for somebody paid by the government to preach and try to influence a child by itself, that has to be an act of violence, yeah. as far as I'm concerned. You know, to mutilate a child, you yeah. know, oh, mutilate that, cancel, yeah. cancel that. I just wonder if there's going to be a backlash. You know, you have a you have a socialist government in Spain, socialist communist government in Spain, and elsewhere you have this. You have the EU pushing it very left. And you have a country like Hungary, for example, which passed a law outlawing propagandizing children in favor of LGBT and gender issues. And their punishment was they were they had the EU funds suspended, whereas this law in Spain is approved by all the EU authorities as up to EU standards. So I just wonder at some point if there's going to be, can you even vote these people out of office is a real question. Um, but I think we see why they hate Hungary so much because they have taken a different tack. Yeah, but that's, that's the point, vote them out of office. And some of that's going to happen this year. But also, it's uh, sometimes, uh, you know, they can uh, achieve something when the people just start to demonstrate, yeah. to get together what we saw with COVID. I still think that was... Uh, uh, a big issue on why the opinion shifted. People started speaking out, and even now I see some of them. Why did they do that? Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're starting to. Sometimes even an article will slip through the censors and talk about the complications of the uh, of COVID and lockdown and all that. Oh my goodness, they're getting to know what the truth is. So we have to cancel that. Uh, so they're still pretty much worried about that. Yeah. Well, let's move on to a piece that you noticed on Lou Rockwell's side a few days ago on August 8th. It was a piece written by Lou, uh, which is always great to read Lou's writing, but it was uh, entitled, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Exposes Big Pharma's COVID Plot to Destroy Us. Very strong article, but very praising of RFK Jr., who we both admire greatly as well. Yeah, and, and Lou makes the point, you know, about the importance of the Kennedy name. Yeah. And I have to admit, in the 60s, uh, you, you know, I was m much more a Republican, and uh, I would have uh, certainly supported Eisenhower over a Democratic candidate. But uh, attitudes have changed. Uh, that does not make... Uh, JFK a hero or the Kennedy name a he heroic uh, name at all but Lou points it out you know that Robert Kennedy uh, is a sincere person has believed uh, believes that uh, compassion is applied to the government which doesn't work very well but that you should be involved in these social issues 
but he's, uh, he's, I know, has felt comfortable, and we welcome him to our conferences and where he would come because he, uh, he's a man of honesty. He is a man of co uh, compassion, and that doesn't mean that uh, you, you can't get along with him and work together. Yeah. He's, a, he's a civil libertarian. He's anti-war, yeah. you know. <laughs> what more? And that was, that was the category of Dennis Cassini's. I worked with him very much. He, sure. He's anti-war. So. so the article was interesting because it does talk, and it sort of goes, I guess, with the last one. It talks about a lot of the opposition that RFK, as you point out, generally identified in the in the more left-leaning category politically but what kind of attacks he's had to sustain over the last few years uh, by challenging some of what's been said on the left by challenging their obedience to the big pharma to the national security state uh, and and Lou mentions uh, uh, the great book by by Kennedy and I think I, I have to say I think the book uh, the real Anthony Fauci started to turn the tide. I think it had a huge effect. It was a best-selling book, despite the fact that it was completely blacklisted by all the newspapers, New York Times, what have you. Still sold tons and tons of copies. It just seems to me that that's when it started to shift. All of the evidence that RFK Jr. put out about Fauci in his past and his incompetence, you know, he did a great service to humanity. In a way, I think of what Robert Kennedy has done. He's become a unifier, bringing some libertarians and conservatives and liberals uh, together. Although the far left can't stand him yeah. <laughs> because he's successful and having a position, uh, the important position like this, uh, I, I, you, we shouldn't even call that uh, the far left. That, because the, it, this, uh, is the, uh, authoritarians. Uh, this is the authoritarian, you know, the fascist <laughs> yeah. type of system. These are the people who want to make money. Yeah. You know? And he's good on corporatism and all the profits. There's so many who are such hypocrites, you know, from, from the far left and re Republicans. Re because they, uh, they talk conservative all, but there's very little resistance because they don't resist the war. So, yeah. so whether it's farm, pharma or weapons uh, manufacturers, in a way it's very similar. You have to support them, and usually they, that goes together. I think Robert uh, sees, sees the difference on that. Yeah, and we'll encourage our readers to go back to August 8th and find that on Lou Rockwell's website because he goes into a lot of detail about what RFK says about the so-called vaccine and a lot of things that are being discovered. There have been, we, we're not talking about it today, maybe we will sometime this week. There have been some mainstream studies in The Lancet and elsewhere that are showing serious issues of myocarditis and other things. So that is in uh, the article that Lou has about RFK Jr. Especially the teenagers now coming down myocarditis yeah. and it's way excessive compared to what- You've seen what that another. then, yeah. Okay, I was gonna yeah. send that over to you. Yeah, I couldn't believe that. So sure. let's, let's move on a little bit more, but it's the same kind of topic. And if we can actually move ahead uh, to that cover with Jeff Tucker's picture, uh, picture on it, it's the guy. Yeah, there we go, thank you. Yeah, we noticed this. We, we reprinted it in RPI, RonPaulInstitute.org today. But this is Jeffrey Tucker, who again has done a stellar job over these two years. Very, very fearless. Um, but he makes a great article about the radical reversal from the CDC after two years. They've essentially reversed themselves uh, on all of the major COVID issues, uh, including... Um, uh, vaccinated and unvaccinated being treated alike, no more six feet apart, no more uh, social distancing, no more trace and track. So it was this, uh, the one in Brownstone there that, um, that we had noticed. And I think it's, uh, it's pretty amazing that they just, you know, on a dime, Dr. Paul, they just go ahead and flip over and say, okay, well, you don't have to do that stuff anymore. Well, why? Well, we said so. You know. <laughs> but <clears throat> I think the facts have forced them to do this because they were on the losing end of this. So they've changed their position. And uh, I, I think it's... Uh, a couple things. It may be just that there's an election coming up and it's a negative for a lot of people. So they had to change that. And it also represents a, a concept of people power when the people start speaking out against it and, and organizing and not doing any violence at all, but just saying, look, enough is enough. What are you doing to our kids? Uh, this is all uh, very good. And they, but in the article, there was also, they'd say, yes, it's easier now, uh, uh, no quarantine, but, but, but. Yeah. The, the one thing, the one big but is, why, why is it okay for us to travel 
and uh, they don't care the percentage wise, probably people marching across our southern borders are more likely uh, to be spreading diseases than anybody else. And I can, I can recall the uh, stories of my grandfather who uh, came uh, from Germany many, many years ago, and I believe he was in Ellis Island, that uh, the main purpose of that was, you know, a few days of observation for uh, diseases and all. And that didn't seem to hurt anybody and it seemed to be permissible. But I, t I tell you what, now it's, we can, they, there's still not allowed to come in if they're not vaccinated, I guess it is what they yeah, require. Yeah, they still won't let them in. So, yeah. So yeah. it's, uh, and then we think about uh, Novak Djokovic, probably the, one of the greatest tennis players of all time. They're still not going to let him in to play the U.S. Open just because he refuses to get a shot that everyone knows doesn't prevent transmission nor infection as basically useless as a vaccine as such. Whatever other uses it might have, that's for a different debate. They still won't let him in and compete. I just wonder if they want to keep him from getting that 23rd Grand Slam title to make him the greatest of all time, just to get back at him for defying them. Yes, and it, and it seems so insane because uh, for him to come in and thousands and thousands of others come in and and they're statistic, statistically, they're much more vulnerable having yeah. brought all kinds of diseases and, and you can't touch it or you're or you really will be canceled, yeah. you, you know, so th that's OK. And that is so arbitrary. But I think people eventually, you know, uh, absorb some of that. But it's a shame how many people if they make him suffer all the way through that is that's that's really criminal. Yeah. So well, here's a couple of great quotes from Tucker's Jeff Tucker's piece. Um, if we can put up the next one, because this, they shouldn't be allowed to forget this. He said, remember when 40% of the members of the black community in New York City who refused the jab were not allowed into restaurants, bars, libraries, museums, or theaters? Now no one wants to talk about that. Think about that. That's a new Jim Crow. Uh, forbidding them from participating in society because they didn't want to take a shot. Just because they don't have a basic understanding about why personal liberty means yeah. and personal property too you know this whole thing and uh, the politics of it is, is sickening uh, what what they have done and it's it, I think one of the worst thing coming out of uh, the COVID episode was you know uh, science and medicine has been undermined you know about what you can do or can't do because of the pharmaceutical industry how they promote one and deny other but uh, I think this whole thing, uh, especially at the height of the lockdowns, was uh, how insane and stupid uh, the uh, declarations of, uh, of medical uh, issues were. I mean, it, but the big thing to me was not so much who is absolutely right or absolutely wrong, but how do you get to the truth by having one dictator and you put the other ones in jail? Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a great way to find out uh -huh. what the truth of the matter is. And, uh, and I think... I think that uh, and uh, really a deep cut into the doctor patient relationship many years ago and I was just barely thinking about this I was probably still in medical school or resident some uh, one of one of the people involved in the economics of all this and he he was he was uh, I, I think uh, a very uh, objective but he he told me he says look he says I know your position but that's not going to happen corporations are going to run your medical practice and there'll be a time when doctors will be joining unions Jeez. and uh, i i keep saying well no not real doctors are independent minded <laughs> but uh so many of them just they go along with it and they don't know who the boss is and it's a you know it's a doctor patient relationship which means the market will handle that pretty well because so, usually usually people people find out uh you know just whether or not they want to try a new doctor pretty easily. Yeah. And, it, and it's, not, it's not from the government who, yeah. uh, you know, is always punishing doctors for fictitious things. Yeah. I want to do a little segment here. There's kind of a famous meme of orientation where it's how it started and how it's going. And I want to just kind of play that with this next little clip. Let's skip that clip and go straight to that first uh, tweet if we can. This is Albert Borla, the CEO of Pfizer, Dr. Paul, CEO of Pfizer. Back on April 1st of 2021, way back then, here's what he tweeted. Albert Borla, excited to share that updated analysis from our phase three study with BioNTech 
also showed that our COVID-19 vaccine was 100% effective in preventing COVID-19 cases in South Africa. 100%. That's how it started. Now let's look at how it's going. This is from him today. Albert Borla, CEO of Pfizer. I would like to let you know that I've tested positive for COVID-19. <laughs> I'm thankful to have received four doses of the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, and I'm feeling well while experiencing very mild symptoms. I'm isolating and have started a course of Paxlovid. Right? It's how it started and how it's going. So then I thought, for a guy that's messed up this bad, I wonder how much he makes a year. Yeah. Let's put this up. I just simply Googled it, you know. How much does Albert Borla earn? What is the salary of Albert Borla as chairman of the board and chief executive officer of Pfizer? The total compensation of Albert Borla at Pfizer is $17,929,000. And without the type of system that we have with government running medicine and uh, running the drug industry, he, he might make a million dollars or something, but yeah, that is, it is so criminal. You know, you said he... Um, he, he was 100% sure of this, and then he had to back down a little bit. But you have to always remember, what is their goal? Yeah. <laughs> so when it's 100%, he might be bragging that, you know, it's going our way. Yeah. You know, and what, what, what do we pay? What, what, what is the cost? Oh, we have to tell people what to do to make sure they're safe and taken care of and they get their medical care. So that, that, that's, what, that's what our job is. But if they're looking for chaos in the streets, uh, they're, they're 100% successful because we sure have it. And uh, even though right now we, we don't see as many pictures on television, but that doesn't mean it's still not happening. Because I bet you, you can still go get some pretty ugly pictures out of San Francisco and yeah. out of LA and the various cities on, on what, how we have deteriorated, you know, in a medical sense, uh, in, in the educational sense, and uh, certainly in the social sense of what's, what's happening on our streets. Yeah. Well, I want to remind our viewers, thank you for joining us live on Rumble. I see our live chat is going well, so all you live chatters out there, thanks for moving over to Rumble, where our live show now resides. Um, if we can put on the last clip to remind our people, this is among, this is the last, there's like less than two weeks left before Anatomy of a Police State our September 3rd, 2022 conference in Washington, D.C. We added some speakers over the weekend, which I will mention tomorrow. Uh, it's going to be a great lineup, a great group of people. I'm super excited. I do want to thank our viewers, our audience. We we'll remind everyone that the Ron Paul Liberty Report is a project of the Ron Paul Institute, uh, which survives as an educational charity through the generosity of people like you. We happily take Bitcoin. I was happy over the weekend to see it pumping up a little bit because we're holding a little bit of that in case of a rainy day. So if you've got some Bitcoin floating around, it's gained a little bit in, uh, in, in value relative to the dollar. We'd love to have that as a donation as well. So thank you very much, Dr. Paul. Very good. And uh, I would say the things that we talked about today, there was one strong hint that there were some positive things happening. And that is that they no longer need to quarantine people and they feel like well success are all those vaccinations and our treatments and lockdowns and all these things have been very successful they didn't talk about the complications now from people taking too many shots and the possibility that there's a lot of people dying from the fact that they took too many booster shots and nobody knows what the future will bring so it, I, why have they backed off if they aren't sold on because they're not sold on they're not they're not doing this because they're accepting the principles that we advocate. They're doing it, I think, for political reasons. I think they want to not have to be, I guess they're on the defense anymore, anyway, because they have support in the Congresses and they have to get their farm on money. So uh, the people uh, will, will uh, you know, do it for political reasons, but uh, it also means that there's enough people waking up and sick and tired of it. And that's why you see some crowds just defying it and they have defied it. One article I read said maybe they're doing it because they realize nobody's following their rules anymore anyway. So, but they have the power and the authority and they establish it. Their goals may not even become close to ours. They might like the idea of, of, uh, of the chaos uh, there. So, uh, and, and there'll be, there will be a residual. It uh, will always be that they did, they did show what they can do with the authority 
Uh, would they try it again? Yes, they, they would try it again. It's sort of like uh, the military draft. Uh, when the draft was ended in the early 70s, I said, we'll get rid of the registration of draft. Uh, but they didn't want to have any problem. We might need it someday, so it's always there. It isn't on the principle that we don't have a right to, uh, you know, in, in, uh, to, to enslave people to, to fight wars that are illegal. So they keep it around, and I think this is the problem that we have. The rules are there. The people are more awake now, which is very, very good. But the whole principle is the problems we have dealt with in the last several years could all have been either avoided or more easily taken care of if we would have just followed the rules of peace and prosperity. I want to thank everybody for tuning in today to the Liberty Report. Please come back soon.